Welcome. I hope you enjoyed the roundtable discussions today. They are always a challenge to make sure that we have something for everybody and that we focus looking forward rather than looking back. And I hope that we will be able to bring into the conversation this afternoon some of the discussions that took place uh, uh, this, today at the roundtables. This is the second Congress. This is the most interactive plenary session uh, of this event. And the way this works is um, Jim Brown, Dave Weisberg, and I will present you some hard data from our research. Some of it is research that we've completed. Some of it is research in progress. Once we present this data, we will use that as a jumping off point for the conversations. And I'd like to start by introducing my friend and colleague, Jim Brown of Tech Clarity. And Thank you. Come on. Please. <laughs> and Jim is going to talk about the joint survey that we do that is across all uh, sectors, <clears throat> not just the user community. Uh, our research has been primarily on the user community. When Jim is done, we'll jump in. Jim, the good podium sure. is yours. Sounds good. So I want to, Brad, thank you for uh, having me present and also for making a suggestion. I had a green and blue shirt on earlier and Brad asked me if I had anything brighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. All right. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is actually, uh, this is the third time we've done this. And what we started with a couple of years ago was going out and saying, what, what should the Second Congress be about? We, we went out and did a sort of a little informal survey to start and said, what are the issues? <laughs> I think we're seeing your tweets there. We're, we're actually having a little Twitter fest as we go. Um, what are the issues that you want to talk about? And what we heard loud and clear back from everybody two years ago was that it was clearly the economy. Last year we had an update on that. We gave a, a bit of a, a refresh on it. And we're doing the same thing here this time. And as we go forward, we'll decide whether this is uh, the economy we should be talking about or are there other pressing issues to, uh, to address here. Um, so right now, it's, this is a much better economy. Um, clearly, I think uh, most of us are in a bit better situation. OK, for anybody that saw Jim Brown on the uh, agenda and thought it was Jim Brown, the football player, James Brown, godfather of soul, or saw me walking around and thought it was Jim Carrey. No. Um, can't do any of those things. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is this joint survey that uh, Brad mentioned. I'm going to talk about the, ni the nice thing is we've got data from 2009, data from 2010, and now data from 2011. And uh, we'll now actually have an opportunity to share not just the data from today, but the data that, um, you know, the trends and how things have changed over the last couple of years. And then, as Brad said, uh, he's going to go into a much deeper study of the market from the customer side. And I will get that right. So a few of the questions that we decided to ask in the survey, when is the market going to recover? And we picked a, a, a time when the market was doing well and said, when are we going to get ourselves back to that level? What will that market look like? What are the things that are changing in the engineering software market that we're all going to have to deal with? And then what strategies are companies developing to address those things, to deal with this new economy that we're moving ourselves into, to deal with the changing trends? And then what are, what are the implications of all of those things? So I started in 2009 in the economy. And the only way I could really give a, an economic update was to quote Dilbert. Um, there was nothing happy going on in the economy then. We were really in a, in a, you know, a bit of a free fall. We weren't sure if we'd hit the bottom. Clearly, we're not all financial analysts. We don't know the answer to what was going to happen. Um, so the, the data was uh, basically a little haphazard. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. Following year, we were able to actually uh, you know, quote, uh, quote the Fed chairman. And uh, you know, now I'd just actually like to come out to all of you. And that's really, by the way, what this survey is. This survey is a survey of people like you and probably many of you in the room. So maybe just a, a quick raise of hands um, in terms of the, the market and the economy. How many people are in a better place now with their business than they were 12 months ago? 
Okay, good, good. Yeah, so did you do the math on that 95 point? Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, just to be clear on, on what this research is, this is not, you know, this is not something that uh, you're going to go out and invest your, uh, your money in the stock market on. This isn't a detailed financial analysis. What it is is the sentiment of the people in the market. This is all of us who are the ones that are either press, analysts, customers of the software, vendors of the software, implementers of the software, that are really in this market, you know, five days, maybe seven days a week. What do we all feel is going to happen? Because I, I think having those measurements, right, and maybe they're imprecise measurements as we heard the other day, having lots of imprecise measurements, should give us some, some valuable trends. Okay. And again, the intent here is just to drive a conversation. If you see something here that's interesting, let's then come back during the QA and let's talk about it. What are the implications? What can we do about it? How can we take advantage of it? I'm going to go through some of the demographics um, just to give you a base idea of who is in here. I'm not going to take you through all of the details. But we had over 400 engineering um, software market participants of different kind. If you see the 41% there are customers. And those are people that are users of the software. These are manufacturing companies, AEC companies, academic companies, uh, for example. We have uh, software vendors made up a very large part as well. And then there were others in, the, in services, channel, hardware, and, and others that included uh, some of us in the press and the analyst community. Some useful definitions, just so you know, we had a little bit more depth so people could understand what is a, what is a customer, because that may not have been clear. Um, so that's there for you. Um, Brad, we are going to make these available, right, at some point. So that's more a slide for you to understand what the questions were later. Um, we actually did something very different this year. Um, before, we had a whole bunch of different choices for what kind of company we, you were, and it was a little bit confusing to people in terms of particularly the software companies. We were asking a few different kinds of, uh, of software companies. Are you engineering software? Are you, you know, more of an enterprise ERP kind of a software vendor? So we asked this first, and then we moved on and asked for the vendors, what kind of a vendor are you? And what we found is that uh, you can see, um, and I know you can't read the pie chart, but 60% were really engineering software suites. They had one or more different solutions um, that are engineering software. We had um, 33, a third, uh, basically one or two specialty uh, engineering software solutions. And then the other ones were more on the enterprise side. In terms of the roles of the people, you see 40%, pretty large chunk, were actually people in design and engineering. Um, you see, you know, other, other groups up there uh, in terms of management, et cetera. Um, it was a pretty good cross-section of the business, but definitely a little bit heavier on the, uh, on the engineering side. From a geography perspective, we asked, where are you doing at least 10% of your revenue? So obviously companies can be doing 10, at least 10% of their revenue in lots, you know, in several different uh, geographies. So, we actually uh, had quite a few, obviously, from North America, but we also were able to get, um, you see, about a, a third of the people were doing business in Asia Pacific, and 46% almost half. In, uh, and, and I know that uh, Europe, Middle East, and, Asia, and, and Africa is sort of a, uh, a North American way of looking at that region of the world, EMEA, uh, but th that is the way we asked. And then in terms of industries, um, good representation from, uh, from manufacturing. Am I going? There we go. Um, almost 20% uh, from government and uh, almost 20% from AEC. So a little heavier on the manufacturing side here, but um, we had enough respondents because we had enough overall to really give us a way to characterize all of the different industries. Okay, so with, with some of that housekeeping behind us, and, and again, you know, if you have questions on that, we can look at it or you'll have that in the presentation. Here's the big question. When are we going to be back? Are we back now? When are we going to get to the, the level of, uh, of revenue and, uh, and energy in this, in this market that we were at in 2005 to 2007? So if you look, about a third of the people, 30%, are over there in the, the two to three years. But the other way to look at this, too, is if you add up the first three columns, you get about two-thirds that are saying it's going to be within the next three years. All right, is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? We're not sure probably a little bit further out, but some of the positive things that you see, more than five years, never, 
um, very low percentages. So we decided to take a little bit, uh, little bit deeper look at this. And first, we're going to look at it by geography. Where is the, gonna, where is the market going to recover first? And the way we try to get a look at that is for those people that are doing more than 10% of their business in these uh, different geographies, did they have a different view on when the market was going to recover? And they did. In fact, you see that of those people that said it's going to recover this year, um, the, the first column, set of, you know, the first in the set of columns is for Asia Pacific. The second is Europe, Middle East, and, uh, and Africa, EMEA. And then as you go further over, the last one is North America. And you see pretty consistently for the first two, North America looks like it might be lagging behind. So the, the, the belief of this group is that North America will probably be recovering a little bit more slowly than some of the other markets. One of the things we did, um, I can't remember, Brad, if it was last year or the year before, I think it was the first year, what we did is we went back and we said, okay, here's what all of us think. Let's then look at the, those people that are, are software vendors versus customers and see if they are thinking differently. And we did see a big difference then. We saw a big difference that actually the, manu the vendors were much more optimistic about how quickly we were going to recover than the customers were. Well, it's kind of a problem because the, manu you know, the companies that are the vendors, unless those customers are signing the checks, they're not going to recover anytime sooner, right? And so we saw that disconnect. We didn't see that disconnect this year. We see people a little bit more closely together in terms of when we're going to respond and when we're going to recover. Although it is still a little bit of a disconnect. You know, you do see 11% versus 19%, um, you know, 11% of the customers. You could probably even take, change that gap a little bit. It's even not quite that big because more of the customers said uh, this year that they didn't have an opinion. Um, so it's actually maybe even a little bit closer. But, you know, I do think we do see sort of the same thing, that the customers are, are a little less optimistic for how quickly we're going to recover. But at the same time, they're all pretty positive numbers. And when you get over to the, you know, more than five years and never, the numbers are, you know, effectively the same for a, a sample size like this. So one of the things, I, now that we've got some data behind us, um, I, I know when we first did this, there was some, some legitimate questions. Well, who are we to actually answer this question, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're in the market, but we're not financial analysts. We clearly didn't know when the market was going to recover. Um, you know, after the, the collapse of the financial system. So I decided to go back and, and take a look. And what you see is that from a recovery perspective, the first bar is, is what we said in 2009. The red one then next over is what we said in 2010. And 2011 is what we say now. And I adjusted, the, you know, the one to two years, two to three years, so that they all matched up. And what we see is that it's kind of been pushing itself out a little bit. I think we're all kind of saying, yeah, it's not now, but it's not four or five years from now, because that sounds too far out. You know, it's, it's two to three years. So I think what that, that tells us is as we look at the data, we may not be the best at predicting this, right? But we still see that, in general, it's going to be over the next couple of years that we're going we're gonna to recover, but that we ought to temper it just a little bit, because we may be a little bit, little bit optimistic. So moving away from the, from the market, we decided to look at, from the financial side of the market, uh, we decided to look at some of the trends, and Brad and I came up with a, a list of some of the things that are going on, some of the sort of major trends that we thought we saw in the industry, and we asked, which of these things are going to impact your business? And we asked that to everybody, and you can see some of the things that are on here. The number one thing that came back, 39%, greater integration between design and analysis software. So that's something that's going to have a pretty significant impact on quite a few of us in this room, quite a few of us that are in the engineering market. New software delivery models like SaaS or the cloud, over a third are saying that that's going to have an impact. The interesting thing, and you can read some of these other things up here, you know, new devices, um, shift from 2D to 3D, you'll see that that was a little bit different by industry. Um, new software packaging, sort of the, app, the appification or, you know, cutting down applications to smaller size. There are a lot of things going on. One of the things that I think is a real key takeaway is that if 39%, you know, if, if a third are being impacted by those top three, 
that means that we've got a lot of people that are being impacted by two, three of these things at once. So there's a lot going on. This is one I don't expect you to read from, from there or maybe even understand when you get it. Then, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a challenging way to look at the data. But I did want to call out a few things here, which are some exceptions based on company type. And these are just some of the things that stood out to me. Um, let's, let's start with services companies. Services companies, the one thing that really sh uh, shoots out at us at that, on the bottom there, uh, I believe it's 62%, said that new software delivery models, these are things like SaaS and the cloud, are going to have a really big impact on the channel. Kind of makes sense, right? That's something that we're going to have to look for. Um, or, I'm sorry, services companies on those that are out there that are implementing. If you look at the orange ones uh, for the customers, you've got the two at the top there, 48% and 43% are combining design approaches, okay, and that's, for example, you know, parametric and direct modeling, and you see also um, the, the one that was one, number one overall, the integration between design and analysis. And then um, the last one that uh, I've got called out on here is uh, for the soft, from the software perspective, um, it, it was still a big issue, uh, you know, clearly the, uh, the new delivery models. And it was roughly half of the companies, 48% said that was going to be a big deal. So depending on who you are and where you sit in this industry, these trends are going to hit you differently and they may be a bigger deal to you. We also looked at this by geography. Wasn't as much of a difference here. A couple of things I thought were pretty interesting and I'm not sure I understand these 100%. So um, this is maybe a good conversation or anybody has some insight to this uh, you know, afterwards so that's uh, maybe have a conversation over a cocktail. Um, Latin America, half of the companies, uh, half of the respondents from Latin America said that new software delivery models were going to be a big impact. That may, make, that may make some sense, economic reasons, for example. But new devices, we asked about things like tablets and some of the mobile devices that are coming out and being able to, uh, to run on those types of things. Those are actually showing up as having a pretty big impact in Latin America. I don't know why. I'd like to, you know, and I'm thinking that somewhere in this room today, uh, we've got some good insight on that. And I think Brad said, uh, whoever comes up with the best answer for that gets free drinks at the cocktail hour tonight. Is that right? By industry, a couple of interesting things that I, I picked out of here, uh, particularly from the AEC market. And again, we had uh, about 20% from the AEC, uh, AEC market. Um, were involved in the study and, and because of the number in the survey, that gave us a pretty good number to characterize them. Um, roughly half feel like these new uh, software delivery models are going to have a big impact on their business. That's pretty significant. About a third said new devices. Okay, and that's more than you see in some, of the other, in some of the other industries. And actually, that's where we see the biggest focus on the shift from 2D to 3D. Maybe, maybe not a surprise on that one. Okay. So what are companies going to focus on over the next couple of years, particularly, particularly you know, for the rest of 2011 and the next year? We sort of do this as a, as a COFES to COFES horizon. Um, I thought the easiest way to look at this data, and actually Brad made a suggestion on this, is these things that are up at the top on the green are all growth oriented. The things at the bottom that are sort of in a reddish hue are, are more decline or, or caution kind of things. And then the yellow one in the middle is, is I guess, probably the, the true caution. So if you see things like growing in existing markets, growing in new markets, new partnerships, new products, those were the things that were the most common strategies we see companies going forward in this, in this next year. The things that fell down are rationalization, wait and see, stabilize, hunker down, try and get myself acquired, or dropping out of existing markets. In fact, we saw nobody saying they're going to drop out of an existing market. Pretty interesting, pretty interesting. I think the real thing to, to look at this is, this is going to be a very positive year in terms of what companies want to accomplish. And at the same time, the yellow one, we're going to, we're going to remain lean. That's the thing that I think you'll see is, is a bit of caution on that as well. So my question is, are we taking the brakes off, right? Are we, are we out of the mode where we were scared, we were hunkering down, we didn't know what to do next? Two years ago, 
what I saw in this group when we were talking about it, we just we didn't even know how to make a decision. We didn't know if we'd hit the bottom. We didn't know if there was another dip coming. We, didn't, we just didn't know. We didn't have any visibility. Last year, we kind of felt like maybe we knew where we were. And this year, it feels like people are a little bit, uh, little bit more comfortable. Not 100%, but a little more comfortable. So you see the areas that actually had the biggest shift. And the way to read this is as you go left to right, those things that go further off to the right are the things that grew the most between last COFES and this COFES. So you see hiring. It was an increase of, of basically two-thirds more companies than last year said they were going to hire, said they're going to hire this year. Okay? Pretty significant indicator. That's investment. That's investment in people. And that's how people are going to go after these new markets, these new products. Right? You see the remain lean shrunk by about a third, over a third, 38%. Stabilize and hunker down, decreased by half. Okay? So I think we're getting the picture of this, right? This is just for anybody. I, I decided we had the data, um, and, and I knew who was going to said that they were planning to hire next year. I know that there are probably some of you or some of your friends that may be uh, looking for uh, your next opportunity. So, um, looks like channels may be a, a good place to uh, to talk to people. So that's really all I had to say today. Um, I, I hope you got a little something out of it, and, and more than that, I hope. It brought up some questions in your mind, something you want to talk about, you want to bring out, and, and maybe we can figure out as a group. So with that, I'll hand it back to Brett. Bottom line, it's still the economy, stupid. Uh, we've been talking about that for quite some time. Um, Science Research has been undertaking some, uh, well, we hope it's significant, uh, and deep research on what customers are thinking. And I'm not going to talk about the economic data that we have that's coming from users, because much of that will duplicate what uh, uh, Jim has had. Uh, you know who we are and what we do. But I, I want to talk for a second about looking for things. Um, this is a bunch of what looks to be, um, when, when I was young, we used to call it the bug races, the static noise uh, coming uh, from the television. Um, but depending on how you look at the data and just changing your perspective, you can actually identify structure within the data. And what we try to do is we try to go back and look at uh, large data sets, some of which we collect, some of which we find, and look to see where the value is. And my contention is that it's not content that, that's king, but first and foremost, it's the context of the, that content. So um, we heard about the fact that the economy is getting better, and I'm not going to show you my data on this. Um, but <clears throat> we've finished several surveys over the last uh, several years. Um, the winter of uh, uh, 2009, we had a survey with 702 user respondents. Uh, the spring one we, that we did has a slightly different data set, which I'll uh, uh, talk to, had 550 respondents. The uh, survey that uh, you'll see the data on uh, from today has 746 respondents. That's cleaned, but still in progress. We expect to close that uh, next week and start doing the data diving and hope to present uh, some hard results to our clients um, uh, later this summer. But as you can see, the, about half are from small companies, about a sixth are from medium companies, and about a sixth from large companies. More than half are engineers and designers, and uh, let's call it two-thirds are daily users of CAD systems. Now, when we do our surveys, our winter survey is uh, of CAD and CAE users. Our spring and our, our summer survey is of CAD, CAE, and what we refer to as data management, which includes PDM, PLM, and, and BIM. Uh, the survey is global in scope, and we've uh, vastly increased our outreach. The current survey that we, are, that we have in progress 
has 500, almost 600 uh, uh, respondents responding in the English language. We have 130 responding in Russian, uh, 30 in Chinese, and a smattering in Spanish and Portuguese. And we cover all industry sectors. Now, this is just a, uh, a gross look at the sectors that have the largest participation. But we have very, very fine-grained data, both in manufacturing and in, in AEC. And the beauty of this is uh, we use this to characterize and do fine slicing and dicing of the data. And <coughs> we look at many different CAD systems. This is the data from one of the surveys. One key point that I need to make for these observations is that the bigger the line doesn't mean more market, the bigger the market. The bigger the line means the richer the data set and the finer we can slice it and dice it reliably. So what we don't do here is look at, well, let's take the two biggest lines, uh, AutoCAD and SolidWorks. That means we have more respondents from users of those software. It doesn't mean that there's more of that, that one of that the other. It means that the data that we have is more reliable from those two companies than it is from the others. And we make comparisons that are, uh, let's say, SolidWorks users have this set of characteristics, and Inventor users have this set of characteristics, and we look for correlations. Same thing goes for CAE software. And we do not just, uh, well, much of the da data that we collect is via SurveyMonkey, but we don't just collect, uh, you know, checkoff box type stuff. Where we do have checkoff box data, we ask people to tell us why, what's behind your, what was in your thinking. And sometimes we, what we'll do is we'll ask a checkoff box question one time and ask it as a narrative the next time to make sure that we're giving the right selections in the, in the data uh, so that we can adjust what we're offering. But sometimes we just ask people what they're thinking and, and uh, look for a narrative. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Dave Weisberg, to come up and uh, spend five minutes on his observations of doing the quick analytics of the data in progress for the current survey. Obviously, I did not get the memo to wear a light-colored shirt this <laughs> afternoon. The area that uh, I'm going to talk about in just the uh, next few minutes is a series of uh, three questions that uh, we asked. Uh, and those questions were basically, what are the driving factors that would cause you to change CAD systems? What are the driving factors that would cause you to change CAE systems? And if you have changed CAD or CAE systems in the past, why did you do it? And it boils down to these, uh, basically these seven uh, reasons. The one that comes out loud and clear uh, is functionality. Either my current system doesn't have the functionality that I need, or this other system has some new functionality that I could apply to my work very effectively. Uh, I have cost up there as, as the second one. It's not necessarily the second most important uh, reason. I think that uh, for the most part, we can realize that in the total overall cost of product or project design and engineering, the cost of software today is fairly nominal compared to all of the other costs uh, that you're facing. People are very much interested in standardization within their organization. I hear lots of comments over the years uh, from people that, hey, we've acquired three different companies, they're running three different CAD systems, it is just a total disaster. Uh, industry trends, very interesting. You know, there is a psychological factor on what people do, even from a technical point of view. I don't want to be the odd man out. 
Um, particularly in the AEC arena, people are uh, involved in uh, selecting systems based upon what their clients want the deliverables to be in, and there are a lot of engineering architectural firms that have to run multiple systems because they uh, have clients that are asking them for uh, different, different data sets. Uh, you also find that, unfortunately, in industries like the automotive uh, area, where if uh, a vendor is supplying components to multiple uh, automobile manufacturers, they're required to uh, use uh, specific versions of software. In that case, it's not just use a particular software package, it's use this particular release of that software package. And then there are vendor relationships. Now, what I found very interesting this year is that that is not the magnitude of an issue for changing systems that I perceive that it had been uh, historically. People seem to be more comfortable with their vendors based on their written comments uh, than what we had uh, seen in the past. And then there is obviously the question of legacy data. Legacy data is the primary reason why people won't change systems. Legacy data, and what I didn't put on this list, is also the training and education of the people on their staff of using a new system. So the combination of training costs and what do I do with my legacy data is the anchor that keeps people from making switches. So these are some of the key comments that we've seen. The, the biggest inhibitor to transition to another CAD system's legacy data. Word for word. Uh, it really stinks to be the only uh, one with a certain package. Let's follow the industry. Uh, I adopt useful new technology when the benefits are great enough to offset the cost. So they want new technology, but they're very cost conscious. Uh, the primary expense is, be, is the training and becoming fluent in the new system. And customer driven. We need to deliver our design in XYZ format, name any one of uh, 212. So, but we also come up with some contradictions. Uh, Jim mentioned uh, some of the uh, new delivery uh, models that are becoming more common. So we have this guy who is saying, we will change if the current software is changed to be a cloud-only uh, method. Obviously, he's very much enthused with the cloud. And then there is the other guy who says, if any of my current vendors goes to a cloud orientation, I'm history. So uh, we get some very, very interesting qualitative input on these uh, surveys that helps us to calibrate the uh, numerical data that we see. Now I've got a kind of an interesting one here. I'm going to put a bunch of uh, comments up on the screen. Now just put them all up. Okay. What group of engineers and users do you think gave us this set of uh, comments? Marshall, who do you think these people are? Well, let me read carefully. <laughs> Done. Time's up. Okay. Alan, where do you think these group of users are involved or come from? <laughs> Anybody else want to take a crack? No. And I'll give I'll I'll buy a drink for somebody who comes up with the right answer to me. <laughs> okay. The top one from Russia. The second one from Russia. The third one from Spain, 
The fourth one from China. What do I see that's significant up there? These engineers are thinking just like the engineers in this country think. And I think that is a very, very significant development uh, that's showing up in our surveys. David, thank you. You're welcome. So let's get to the money here. We asked our uh, respondents what had they done in the last 12 months during